Welcome back for the second half of this episode, covering the cross-examination testimony in the Solar City bailout trial of Robin Denholm, current chair of the Tesla board. Transcripts for this testimony are found in document 468 on plainsight.org. The cross-examination of Robin Denholm is conducted by Daniel L. Berger, a principal at Grant & Eisenhower. A graduate of the Columbia University School of Law in 1979, he is now a member of the faculty and a lecturer in law at his alma mater. Berger's legal victories of note include some of the largest securities litigation cases in history, achieving successful recoveries for classes of investors including Enri J.P. Morgan Chase & Company, securities litigation with $150 million awarded, Enri Merck Vider & Zetia, securities litigation with $215 million awarded, and Enri Sendent Corporation, securities litigation with $3.3 billion awarded. So this is not Daniel's first time around the billion dollar block, nor is it his first appearance in the Delaware Court of Chancery. His cross of Den Holm starts on page 2075, and he gets right to work. So let's start by talking about the recusal. Once the transaction was approved by the Tesla board, the transaction where Tesla acquired Solar City, once it was approved, you spent several months presenting and responding to stockholders and educating proxy advisory firms about the acquisition, correct? Den Holm says yes, we spent quite a bit of time, yes, educating. To advocate with the investors that they vote yes, right? Den Holm answers, I would say yes. So right out of the gate, Berger has Denholm confirming her bias in this transaction, where she was supposed to be a disinterested independent overseer, and this sets the stage for him nicely. Berger wants to confirm that when Denholm was speaking to those investors, that she was telling them, at the time, that Musk was recused from any deliberations by the board on the Solar City acquisition other than those about the strategic rationale for the merger. Denholm tries backing away from that statement, saying they were only recused from the votes, but that's not what she was telling investors at the time nor what she said during her deposition in this case. Here are the verbatim transcripts, and I would just like to refer you to a sentence in the talking points prepared for you. It's about 10 sentences down on the right. It starts as follows. Please note that Elon will discuss the vision, strategic rationale for the combination, but will then leave the call as he recused himself from any deliberations outside of the strategic rationale during the process. And that's something you told the investors, right? That Mr. Musk had recused himself from the deliberation outside of the strategic rationale? Answer, well, obviously they are the talking points that we had for the investors, yes. Question, so the idea was that what you're telling people was that Mr. Musk was recused and didn't participate in the deliberations other than the ones concerning the strategic rationale. Answer, that's what I said, yes. Question, when you told this to investors, you were trying to be honest with them, I assume. Answer, I was being honest with them. She wasn't being honest with them. Even from her own direct examination, we know Musk was fully immersed in the process from his daily updates with Evercore and receiving materials prior to the Tesla board ever seeing them. Even saying Musk had recused himself was not truthful, as Berger goes into next. Now, it was the board who decided who was recused from this transaction, correct? The board with advice from our advisors, both our legal counsel as well as financial advisors. The board had to refer this question to their financial and legal advisors for clarification. Musk did not voluntarily recuse himself. Berger asked Denholm about Kimball and if he fully participated in all the deliberations and the vote, which Denholm admits he did. She says the board decided that he didn't need to be recused. In fact, Kimball during his testimony said it was never even brought up at all. Denholm confirms that she knew about Kimball's 147,000 shares in Solar City. Berger then asked her if the board knew that almost all of those shares had margin calls on them at the time of the deal. And of course, she can't recall knowing that because as Berger informs her, Kimball actually told us in court that he didn't tell them because he thought it was none of the board's business what he was doing with margining his Solar City stock. Next up for discussion is Steve Jurvetson and his participation in the deliberations and votes on the transaction as decided on by the board. This was despite the fact that Jurvetson, although he sat on the board at Tesla, was far more heavily invested in Solar City both personally and through his DFJ fund. The F in that fund acronym was John Fisher, who was on the board at Solar City as a result of their firm's investment there. And Jurvetson would have known all about the problems at Solar City through Fisher. These two men would have suffered huge losses personally and through their fund when Solar City failed. Now what's even more interesting is that at the board meeting where it was decided that Kimball and Jurvetson didn't need to be recused, Musk was present during that meeting and was part of the discussion whether or not they should be recused. Denholm says she can't recall if Musk was there or not, but thanks to the meeting minutes of May 31st and June 20th, Denholm's suddenly failing memory doesn't need to be relied upon. Even though portions of the document are redacted, which again seems absurd in a legal trial if we're being honest, the plaintiff's lawyer can still confirm that Musk participated in the decision to allow his own brother and a seriously conflicted cross-investing board member to participate in this entirely corrupted process. 
Page 2088, Berger starts talking about the special board meeting of February 29th, 2016. A special meeting Denholm can't even agree was called by Musk. Of course, we know from Musk's testimony that it was him that called the meeting and had done so just the day before on February 28th through his co-opted lawyer, Mr. Marin, at 2.32 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon for a meeting at 3 p.m. the following day. At 2.43 p.m. Monday afternoon, the review materials for the meeting were sent out by email to the board members and received by the members of the board seven minutes prior to the meeting. Seven minutes they were given to assess what would be, in the end, a $6 billion debt and stock transaction. Musk presented the Project Icarus materials to the board and failed to tell them that he had already told his cousin, Lyndon Rive, that this bailout was going to happen. He also did not tell the board why he needed to get this done at this point in time. And Berger confirms through Denholm's videotape deposition that this is what she had already stated about this question on the record. Question, now at this meeting, did Mr. Musk tell you that he had discussed this proposal with Lyndon Rive? Answer, I don't recall. Question, did he tell you why he wanted to make this proposal then, that is in February of 2016? Answer, I don't recall why then. Question, you don't recall what he said about it? Answer, no, I don't recall him talking about why this point in time was the time. Musk made no mention at this meeting of the liquidity issues Solar City was suffering through in February. Musk didn't tell them, right after this meeting, that he contacted his cousin to tell him he's going to try again, even though he was told no at this meeting. Next meeting is March 15, 2016, the one we told you Chesler skipped over during Direct, and Berger brings up JX897 to go over a few things. All Berger needs from this exhibit is an answer to this question. The board was very clear that management was not to go and pursue an acquisition of Solar City at that time, correct? And he gets his answer. At the March 15th time, that's what the minutes say. Specifically, the board determined not to proceed with evaluating a potential acquisition of Solar City or other similar business at this time, and directed management to instead focus its efforts on the execution of current business matters. Yet, Musk went ahead anyway without board approval to pursue that acquisition, which he presented for a third time on May 31st. And when Musk came back for the third time, he brought his own hand-picked lawyers for the deal with him. Musk and Gracias, with Marin's help, had been vetting which legal firm they wanted on this, and they chose between Kirkland and Ellis and Wachtell Lipton. This is straight from Musk's testimony. Denholm previously told the court that it was the board who decided to retain Wachtell for the deal, and that they made that decision at the May 31st meeting. She also claimed the board would hire their own financial expert, which was Evercore. However, Berger brings up Exhibit 3226, something referred to as a privilege log. This is a document where lawyers list documents that are privileged in a case. And buried in the fine print of this document are items numbered 142, 143, and 144. In the description category, it reads that these are an email string reflecting legal advice of in-house counsel and Wachtell re-selection of financial advisor to potential Solar City acquisition. And the dates on those documents were May 27th, 28th, and 30th, respectively. Let's unpack that. Although they can't see what the documents are, the plaintiff's lawyers can see all this information from the notations accompanying the privilege, and those are admissible. These documents were dated May 27, 28, and 30, which all obviously predate the May 31st meeting being referred to here. Berger elaborates on ramifications from this information. Now, so what this indicates is that by this point in time, Wachtell was already retained and, in fact, was retained concerning a potential acquisition of Solar City. It was understood that the acquisition was going to be Solar City at that point, even before Mr. Musk brought it back to the board. Meaning, all the other nonsense about investigating other targets can be thrown right out the window. And there's something else that indicates. These emails were discussing the selection of a financial advisor for this acquisition, which means that they were very likely already discussing Evercore's involvement in this deal four days prior to this meeting, since they were the group that was selected. That's a lot of fact-finding from a very simple, buried notation in a document outlining the documents that the defendant wanted to keep privileged. It completely ends the debate about who retained Wachtell and what the acquisition target company was going to be. A 20-word footnote that completely contradicts Tesla's chair of the board. This is a brilliant discovery and tactic because the only way for the defendant's team to refute these statements now is to remove the privilege on these documents and introduce them fully into evidence, which would allow everybody to see what information was in there. Now, Berger confirms with Denholm that it has been said in this case that you were the lead director responsible for leading the due diligence, right? Denholm responds, yes. Once we decided to actually pursue an acquisition, I took the lead in terms of negotiation, the process in terms of how we actually went about evaluating, and then pursuing an acquisition in the solar space. 
And as the lead in this discussion, Denholm confirms again that she had no knowledge of the conversations between Musk and Lyndon Rife, and it was not discussed at the May 31st meeting. Musk didn't tell anyone at that meeting about the status of SolarCity's liquidity concerns. Musk didn't tell anybody about the situation with SolarCity's diminishing projections for megawatts installed in 2016. Everything Berger is asking Denholm here is complete news to her. Look at her responses. Every response from Denholm on this page is either I don't know or I don't recall, and it just keeps going on like that to the next page. Musk didn't tell the board at the meeting that after Musk told Lyndon Rive that Tesla was going to buy SolarCity, Lyndon Rive told Musk that if you don't buy us, we're going to have to do an equity offering, so it's either you buy us or we do an equity offering. However, as we know, that plan B was not a possibility. Knowing that, it's certain if Tesla did not bail out SolarCity, it was going to be history. Musk didn't tell the board that he told Rive that he would go ahead with this deal in May, prior to this meeting. Then he called Rive back and told him it was going to have to wait until June. Musk did not tell the board that Lyndon told him, if you do an acquisition proposal, I'm going to need a bridge loan. Musk didn't tell the board that in response, he told his cousin, don't worry, I've got you covered. We'll give you a bridge loan. Musk did not tell the board that the reason Rive and SolarCity did not do an equity offering up to this point is that they were waiting for Musk to come back with an offer. Dan Holm, as the person named by Musk to lead this deal from the Tesla side, was given exactly none of that information. The next segment delves back into the issues of the Model X, which were the primary reasons given for not pursuing the SolarCity deal at this time. On top of those issues, in the May 4, 2016 shareholder letter, Musk announced he was moving the Model 3 launch up by two years. Denholm tries to tell the court that the Model X issues were mainly sorted around by then, but the fact of the matter is, the Model X is still a headache for the company. Just last month, Tesla Audi's headline read, Tesla still haven't fully recovered from difficult Model X ramp, because as Musk said, the Model X is an extremely difficult car to build. And the October 26, 2016 earning calls transcript, JX2180, confirms that back in May, the company was still in, quote, bloody hell with regards to the Model X, according to Musk. Adding to this headache was Musk moving up the Model 3 launch by two years, which was a bet the company product, meaning if Model 3 had failed, the company would have been lost. Berger skips over the May 31st meeting for the time being to the meeting of June 20th, which was another meeting called by Musk at the last minute. Another meeting where Musk sent out the materials for review just prior to the meeting at 12.51 a.m. for a meeting he called at 2 p.m. the following day. The meeting when Evercore were to present to the board what they had discovered, as well as materials labeled draft proposed board resolutions, an illustrative offer letter, and an illustrative blog post regarding the offer letter. In other words, all the letters and social media posts were pre-written in advance of the outcome of this meeting. And that's because Musk had been working with his co-opted lawyer Todd Marin and Evercore preparing and reviewing these materials in advance of the board ever seeing them. JX1232 is a series of emails starting on June 18, 2016 with Marin writing to Musk two days before the meeting. I'm getting the board package ready for the meeting Monday afternoon. I will plan to send you a full draft of the package before sending it out to the board on Sunday night. In the meantime, here's a first draft of the blog post that we would publish on Tuesday afternoon, attached and copied below. The blog post also includes the text of the draft offer letter. Since I would like to include both of these pieces in the board package, it would be great to get any comments that you have on these by tomorrow, midday. Musk had already been recused in this transaction, yet here he is spearheading it with the GC of the company, who is supposed to be working on the company's behalf, not on Musk's pet project. The email continues, if you can't get to it in time, I could just send it to the board in draft form, and you and I could iterate on the blog post after the board meeting. Berger shows Denholm the redacted version of this draft letter that the company set in as evidence, then shows her the unredacted version they managed to find so they could see the full details of the letter. It's JX1225, and on page 5 is the blog post that Marin and Musk came up with. Reading the article titled, Tesla Makes Offer to Acquire Solar City, the post outlines everything about this bailout in advance of the board meeting. The offer letter draft reads, June blank 2016, addressed to Lyndon Rive. We are writing on behalf of Tesla's board of directors to confirm our discussion earlier today. Discussions that had not happened yet, it's worth noting. And the letter Musk and Marin drafted is signed, Sincerely, Elon Musk, Chairman of the Board of Directors. This is contrary to Denholm's sworn testimony from the previous day, who told the court the way it worked was that the board approved the transaction, and then Denholm tasked Mr. Marin with drafting the offer letter. However, that letter was already written and vetted by Musk two days prior. Denholm responds to this by saying it would be normal for the CEO of the company to be working through what would happen if something was actually approved. And Berger keywords this for her. If something was approved, correct? But at the time the letter and the blog post were written, nothing had been approved. 
In fact, in theory, if not practice, Evercore still had to present the case for Solar City against three other possible targets. And as Berger correctly states in a question form, don't you think that it conditions the board requires the board when it's looking at whether it should look at other solar companies if the CEO of the company, Mr. Musk, comes to the board with a draft letter to acquire Solar City even before that consideration has been made? Denholm tries arguing that Evercore presented Solar City as the best option because, of course, they did. That's what Musk told them to do. So Musk, Marin, and Evercore come to this board meeting with this draft letter for Solar City. A draft blog post and an obvious indication that it was Solar City Musk wanted to acquire from previous meetings, with documents supporting this in the privilege log showing when Wachtell was retained. Denholm again tries saying Evercore was looking at the other companies as well, but as Berger pointed out, Evercore and Marin didn't come to the meeting with draft letters for any of the other companies, and the one written for Solar City was emailed out by Marin to Musk at 9.17 a.m. two days prior to this presentation. In fact, this draft blog post had already been sent out to the company's public relations firm, Sard Verbenen, so that they could pump this out as quickly as possible immediately after they got the green light. All they had to do was fill in the date and the price and publish it. The next several pages keep hammering this point home, that the recused, conflicted CEO was receiving these materials in advance of the meeting for approval before any of it was ever shown to the board. Denholm says, Marin just wanted to make sure Musk was comfortable with the materials before the board was allowed to see them, because if he wasn't comfortable, it wouldn't get sent out to the board. Berger confirms with Denholm that the board was unaware of this back and forth between Marin, Musk, and Evercore or the creations of the draft materials, but she says she's not surprised by it. At least today she's not surprised by it. It was a different story during her videotape deposition, transcripts are JX2798. Question, and previous to sending it, Evercore had sent the draft of its materials to Mr. Musk because he asked them to, correct? Answer, I don't know that other than this email that you've shown me which I've not seen before. And of course it wasn't just Evercore, it was Marin as well. On to JX3219, an email chain involving Wachtell Lipton, the company lawyer in this matter supposedly acting on behalf of the company, but they too were co-opted to act for Musk when he wrote to Courtney McBean at Evercore as follows. Courtney, client wants to send a draft of your deck to Elon sometime this morning. Could you let me know if that's doable? The client in this case, Berger confirms, was Marin, not the company, not the board, and not Denholm. And in the next exchange is, finally, the description of the role Denholm was supposed to be playing in this transaction. According to Musk, Berger says, you were the disinterested independent director that led the board's negotiations. Am I right about that? Denholm replies, yeah, well, I don't know if Elon said that, but I was, yes. To this point in her testimony, have we heard anything from Denholm to indicate she was disinterested or independent in any way, shape, or form? Not even during the direct examination by Musk's lawyers did she appear to be independent. Berger recites Musk's direct examination testimony in this regard as asked by Chesler at the beginning of this trial. Who handled the negotiations of the transaction from the Tesla side? Who was the person in charge? Robin Denholm. What was her position at Tesla? Director. Who set the price of each Tesla offer and counteroffer, sir? I believe that was Robin Denholm. And who set the other terms and conditions of the deal other than price? Robin Denholm. And what about the final price and final deal terms? Who set those? Robin Denholm. That's how you set your chair of the board up to be your personal scapegoat. Berger confirms with Denholm that at Tesla there was no special committee established, such as the one at Solar City, and Denholm was not a committee of one. Each of those questions that Chesler asked Musk referred to actions that were in fact participated in by both Jervidson and Kimball, along with Aaron Priest and Buss. Denholm says she was just one of five directors that considered and voted on the bailout, but she says she led the process and sort of acted as the crowling force. And at this point, Berger drops this bomb on her head. Ms. Denholm, we've looked at, in this case many times, all the meetings of the board between February 29th and August 1st of 2016 and none of those minutes reflect that you were delegated any authority by the board with regard to the Solar City transaction. There was nothing in writing delegating any oversight or negotiating authority to Denholm by the board or from the board. This person that Musk identified as the sole person responsible for determining the deal on behalf of Tesla and its shareholders. Still with the June 20th meeting, Berger confirms that the meeting ran from 2 until 4.30 and that Musk was there at the meeting and took part in the discussion. Of course, we've covered this previously, Musk was there for the entire discussion. The minutes read, based on Evercore's analysis, the directors then discussed with input from management and representatives of Evercore, the value and structure of a potential acquisition proposal for SolarCity. Musk was present for the discussion of the walkaway price. 
Musk was also there for the discussion about the strategy for negotiating and obtaining an acquisition price for SolarCity that was attractive to the company, as the minutes indicate. After all of these discussions were done, Musk is then recorded as leaving the meeting with Gracias. But before he left, Musk took part in the discussion about whether or not the offer to SolarCity should be arranged and should reflect a premium to the current stock price. In the discussion of various possible exchange ratios, the consideration of a range between 0.122 to 0.131 shares indicating a share price between 2650 and 2850, which we know from Denholm's direct examination was Musk's number, not the commission number from Evercore. Moving to the July 5th meeting, which Musk attended in its entirety, Evercore once again sent all the materials to Musk ahead of time for approval, and the board did not get those materials until after Musk cleared them for distribution. Something else Denholm didn't know. Page 2 of these minutes reads, Discussion ensued among the directors and the representatives of Evercore regarding SolarCity's financing and liquidity needs. Musk was there, but failed to tell the board that SolarCity needed $200 to $300 million worth of cash immediately, as determined by their own financial advisors. And Musk did not tell the board at that time that SolarCity had once again come very close to violating its liquidity covenants in May and June. With Musk in the room, the Tesla board also discussed an effective negotiating strategy for SolarCity despite the fact that the board chair for Solar City was sitting right there in the room with them. Right after this meeting, Musk called Don Kendall, who was half of the Solar City Special Committee. Dan Holm was unaware of this call, or what was discussed, and that call was never reported to the Tesla board as is required for Musk to do. Same thing with the calls that Musk made to Evercore after that meeting. He didn't report them to the board, and Dan Holm has no idea what Musk was talking about with the bankers on those private calls. So the timeline is, Musk is in the room while the negotiation strategy is being worked out. His first call after that meeting is to his own special committee member at Solar City, where he is chairman, and the next call after that is to Evercore, the financial representatives for Tesla. All of this is being done behind the board's back. And at this point of the testimony, court broke for the morning recess at 10.49 a.m. to resume at 11. We are also going to take a break at this point, and when we return, we will wrap up Denholm's cross-examination and give some final thoughts on this trial before the decision comes down later this month. When that episode is ready, you'll find the link right here. <laughs> 